You've captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You've opened my eyes to your wonders of new You've captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful Our grace, Heavenly Father, we have gathered here to worship you today. Thank you for your presence that we've already begun to recognize. And we just ask that you would continue to abide with us as we praise, honor, and glorify you in everything that is said and done. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as far as announcements are concerned, there are quite a few, so you're going to have to bear with me for a while. On Monday evening at uh, 5.30, the ladies' Bible study will be continuing. And so, ladies, come and be a part of it. This will be the third week uh, of this particular Bible study. And so, come and be a part of Trusting God's Plan, illustrated in game shows. And um, so, I know that uh, the ladies have really been enjoying that, so come and be a part of it. And then Wednesday evening, you have Bible study here at the church at 7 o'clock. And then, or if you are not able to be here at 7 o'clock, um, well, let's, let's just say I've spent a, quite a bit of time lately being here alone by myself. Because most of you like joining it on Zoom. Now, I know there's a couple of you that don't like joining on Zoom and you're not here on, anyway. I'm just, I'm not going to point them out at all, but... <laughs> all of a sudden she starts crawling under the view, anyway... Uh, but anyway, 7 o'clock, Wednesday night, if, if, like I said, you can either join us on Zoom or you can join us here uh, at the church. Then we have an extremely full July. There just seems like there's going to be one thing after another after another, which is great to see. It. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we're finally coming out of the whole COVID situation when you start seeing this many activities beginning to take place again. Sunday evening, next Sunday evening at about around 7 o'clock, I think it says 7 o'clock-ish uh, on, on the slide when it comes up. But uh, next Sunday evening, we will be having our Independence Day celebration here at the church. We will be having food, fun, and fireworks. And so come and be a part of that next Sunday evening. Then on Sunday, oh, sorry, then on Wednesday, July 7th at 7 o'clock, Dr. Cindy and Rob North will be here for a deputation service. They are our missionaries uh, in, at Africa Nazarene University. She is actually the chaplain at Nazarene University in Nazarene, Africa Nazarene University. She's actually the chaplain there. Uh, he is in charge of uh, student development, and uh, they are here on deputation, uh, and so they will be here on... Wednesday, July 7th, and that will not, I'm going to repeat this, that will not be on Zoom. You must be present to win. Okay? So come and be a part of that, and make sure you bring your checkbook or bring some extra cash, because everything that we bring in, 
will go to help their ministry that they are doing over in Kenya. And so come and be a part of this very important service. And then on Sunday evening, July 12th, we do have the right dates, Ashley. Thank you for fixing that for us last week. July 11th and 12th, Sunday evening, July 11th, we'll begin our Northeast Texas District Assembly and Convention. I do believe it starts around 6 o'clock in the evening, and then it will be all day Monday, ending Monday evening with ordination service, which is always a great thing to be able to be a part of, to see uh, young men and women being ordained in the Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> then also... Promise Keepers is coming up uh, on July 16th and 17th. Uh, if you noticed last week, I put in here that it was $85. Well, that was the early bird price. When Ronnie went on this week to to uh, secure his uh, place to uh, Promise Keepers, he calls me up and he said, I thought it was $85. And I said, I thought it was too. And he said, well, it's now 99 So... We, I re-looked it back up, and sure enough, the early bird price has expired. It's $99. But men, please sign up and be a part of this. I know that you're going to, you, it's a life-changing experience. So be a part of that. $99 is not much. If you can't afford to go, as I've said before, the church will pay it for it. In fact, I know of a couple guys in church that have already said they would help pay for somebody to go. So guys, go, come and be a part of that. It'll definitely be worth it. And then there's also movie night coming up on July 23rd. Uh, we will be, we're going to start that up again. It, you know, it's been almost two years since we've done that. So I'm looking forward to that. It'll be on a Friday evening. And they're gonna, we're going to be uh, featuring God's Not Dead, A Light in the Darkness. The movie, of course, is free. But uh, if you want to donate to the Youth and Children's Fund, uh, you're more than welcome to do that and bring money for snacks and stuff like that. So anyway, it's a great it's a great opportunity to gather together for fellowship and, and also to be able to help these uh, other in areas of endeavor of ministry within our church. The only other announcement I do need to remember, and, you know, for a preacher, I should not ever forget this one, but, you know, uh, you'll see in your bulletin that our offerings are, have been a little bit off this month. And uh, so we, we could definitely use, with this being the last Sunday of the month, we could use, definitely use a little bit of boost in that area. The offering box is back here on the wall. And so I uh, just want to re remind you that uh, God has been good in all the time. And so let's continue to give faithful, faithfully because God does bless. Amen. All right. Well, let's continue to worship him in song this morning. As we continue to worship, feel free to worship in the way that God has led you today. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here. Healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
As we prepare for prayer this morning, I'd like to invite you, if you would, to stand. You know, 
Christmas, there are a lot of things that seem to be going on lately. We need to, of course, remember to pray for Nelda's family as they're grieving the loss of mom, grandma, great-grandma, and great-great-grandma. It's a lot of generations. But we need to remember to pray for them. We also need to remember to pray for Joyce. The second round of chemo that she had uh, was, well, the, the the actual part of chemo wasn't that bad. It was the vitamin supplementals that they give to try to help rebuild the white blood cell count just really hit her hard this time. It hit her bad the first time. This time is even harder. And so we've got to remember to pray for Joyce in this process as well. Also, uh, I put on the prayer request, Kevin. Some of you have been asking what's going on with Kevin, but I want to make you aware that now that I have a little bit more permission to do so. But he passed out at work a few weeks ago because and was coughing up blood. And when they went to the doctors and they ran tests, they found some spots on his lung that they weren't real happy with and did a biopsy, and it has come back cancerous. But you know what? He believed God can heal. I believe God can heal. We believe that God can heal. And so we're going to ask for God's healing to continue to be upon him. And so we need to remember to pray for Kevin. Uh, this is uh, being a little bit of a shock to the family as well, as you can imagine. But, you know, God's at work. And we've got to give it to God and allow God to do the God thing, right? So we need to remember to pray for, for him. Also need to remember to pray for uh, Ray, uh, you know, with the passing of Nelda. He's lost a friend in this, and uh, so we need to remember to pray for Ray throughout this process. Uh, he had intended on being at church this morning, uh, but uh, things came up that uh, prevented him from being able to do so. But he just wanted us to know he's okay. He just what, isn't able to be here today. So do remember to pray for Ray. Seems like there was somebody else that I'd put on the list. My brother does want to say thank you for your prayers for him. He had the privilege of being able to ring the bell after his proton therapy was concluded. And uh, so that's a joyous thing, right? To be able to ring the bell. And so anyway, as we sing this uh, wonderful course through one more time, I just want to remind you, that the altars have been opened all morning. And it's a time for you to be able to come and say, Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you've given to me. Or it's a time for you to be able to come and say, Lord, the weight of the world has been upon my shoulders and I really need these today. Huh? Oh, yes, thank you. And so whichever the case may be, I want to remind you that these altars have been open for you this morning. Roxy reminded me we need to remember to pray for Tommy. Tommy went in for... A, to, for pre-surgery uh, and ended up finding out that he wasn't going to be able to have surgery because of some issues. They've got that straightened out now, praise the Lord. They've got that all straightened out. He has now been passed to be able to do surgery on his shoulder. Sorry, better explain what it's on, right? But now he's waiting on the doctor to be able to recommit to a date. So it's always something, amen? But we'll allow God to work in that area as well. So as I said before, these altars are open for you as we continue to worship through song. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Who oh, cast me not away from Thy presence, O oh Lord, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew the right spirit within me. But gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for the bountiful blessings that you give to each and every one of us. 
we thank you that we still do have this opportunity to be able to gather together and to worship you, to give you all the honor and glory and praise that you deserve. We look around the world, and even though we may be going through difficult times within our own lives, we look around the world and we can actually see how well we are blessed. And so we do want to thank you and praise you for that. And just believe, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to anoint and bless your faithful people. But Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would go to each and every one of these that have been made mention of, and even those that were not made mention of, that need that very special touch from you. We are so thankful, Heavenly Father, that you are the great physician, that you are the mighty healer, that you heal and touch in a multitude of different ways. Whether it be physical, whether it be emotional, whether it be psychological, whether it be financial, you've always been there to heal and to touch. And so we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to do so. We ask that you would wrap your loving arms around the young family as they continue to go through this grieving process after the loss of Melda. Do the same thing for us as the church family as well. Just wrap your loving arms around us and hold us so close and Maybe even whisper in our ears that it's going to be okay. It'll be all right. For we know, Heavenly Father, there was a great place that was waiting for her. And for those of us that continue to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as personal Lord and Savior, we will once again be able to gather together. So, Heavenly Father, just continue to be so close as we worship you today. You just use this time, Heavenly Father, to speak to us, to speak to our hearts and minds in a way that only you can as the Lord God Almighty. Open us up as this song reminds us. Cleanse our heart, Heavenly Father. We ask that the Holy Spirit would change us from the inside out. So help us all to be more like your Son, Jesus, in everything we say and do. For we do ask this all to be done in the precious name of the one true risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew right spirit within me. And all of God's people will say, Amen. You may be seated. Except for fours. Fours can't be seated. Well, you know, I'm trying to thank Forrest, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is going to be the first sermon that you will be giving post-graduation. He has officially graduated with a degree in ministry. Yes. Yes. And so... It is an honor to be able to have him to come and bring the word today. I don't know about you guys, but um, it's a bittersweet thing that's about to transpire. It was kind of like when when, um, Norita and John came. I knew from the very beginning when they got here, it wasn't going to be long. And she was going to be called the pastor somewhere else. And I knew the same thing was going to take place with Forrest. In fact... I'm not going to say it was my prayer, but it was kind of my heart's desire that he may take a little longer to graduate, you know? It wasn't ever my prayer, though. But, you know, it was either. There you go. But, you know, it's been incredibly awesome for him to be able to be here and to watch him grow. Do you all remember his first sermon he ever gave? He wishes you wouldn't. This I'm speaking from experience of my first sermon I ever gave. But you know, God, we've watched him mature, have we not? We've seen it in his sermons, we've seen it in his life, and we're so thankful for you, Forrest. And um, whatever God has in store in the future, we know that you're going to be looking to God first for direction. So we praise the Lord for that. But at this time, I'd like to ask Forrest if you would come. And bring the word that God has laid upon your heart. Well, believe it or not, 
Am I on? Y'all hear me okay? <laughs> well, believe it or not, last Sunday would have been six years since I preached my first sermon. So, I preached my first sermon on Father's Day six years ago. But today, as a little bit of a growth in Christ, I would like to talk about excuses and how they have to do with our outreach. You see, there's a lot of ways we can stop ourselves from doing outreach in our community around us. And just think if some of the more substantial figures in the Bible, if they would have made excuses where they wouldn't have done outreach. Imagine what would have happened if Moses would have refused to go back to Egypt. Imagine what would have transpired if Paul would have decided once he got his sight back to just go back to doing what he was doing instead of following Jesus. We very likely wouldn't have the church in its current form today. Imagine how everything would have been different if Jesus wouldn't have took the three plus year journey to the cross. Knowing full well that he was going to die for our sins, he still chose outreach over excuses. So today the portion of scripture I'm going to read out of comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19, and out of reverence and respect for God's word, I'd ask that you would please stand on me this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it starts by saying, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those who do not have the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of Scripture, and we thank you for this letter that Paul is expressing here, a little bit of how to maybe do a little bit of outreach. We pray that as we go throughout the rest of the service, that you would anoint the Scripture and that you would use me as a vessel for what you want to be portrayed today, Lord. We ask all this in your heavenly name. Amen. Maybe seated. Well, here we see one of one of Paul's letters, which of there are very, very many in the New Te- in the New Testament, but this one is very specifically addressed to the church in Corinth. You see, we see him explain this idea of outreach based on his own experience, and who better to explain outreach through personal experience than Paul? I mean, if there was a resume that you were to write up. Uh, When you entered into the outreach field, Paul's resume would probably be about a mile long at this point. We see that Paul makes no excuses. When he says that he seeks others to bring them to Christ, you know, that got me thinking. You know, he could have given some excuses. Well, what are some excuses that we could give, that we can overcome? Well, the first one that came to my mind and one that I used a lot in my early, early years of being a Christian is... You know, me and that person, we wouldn't fit very well together. Our personalities clash. You see, this is the first excuse I thought about when reflecting on these, and it can be made quite often when referring to outreach. You see, at first glance, this one makes sense. You know, I might not get along with someone, therefore I'm not the one that should bring the gospel to that person. But when you read the scripture we just read, it completely voids the whole argument. We see that Paul became what he needed to be to each group so that he could reach them. To the Jews, he became like the Jews. And to the Gentiles, he became like the Gentiles. Let's set the story straight here. He did not become like these people in word and deed. Rather, we're told to be in the world, but not of the world. But rather, he came to them and provided to them what they needed based on who they were. I'm sure for some it was a friend. Others, it could have been hope in a dark time. And still others, it could have been a Savior. You see, because a Savior is what each and every one of us needs. 
But Paul was able to fill each and every one of these needs and these people. To reach these people, he became like them. This kind of reminds me how in high school that each group of students had their own hangout spot. The athletic kids and the football kids, well, they were mostly found in the weight room or the locker room. Well, the, the theater kids and the debate kids, they were mostly found in the, the arts classrooms. For me, it was the ag kids. We were always found either working on something in the ag shop or down at the bar and messing with animals. And then there were even those, you know, less than reputable kids, the ones that really didn't fit in anywhere, where they always used to hang out behind the cafeteria. You see, not only did the kids know this, though, the principal at our school knew this. So whenever she would have to go get a kid that wouldn't come when she called over the intercom, she knew where to go. She knew that Forrest was an ag kid, so she wouldn't go looking for me in the locker room. She'd come down to the mechanic shop. You see, each of these groups represent a certain type of people, and in order to reach them, we have to go where they are. We cannot expect people to simply come to church, though this is sometimes how it happens. That's not how people work. We must go into the harvest field while we can, in order to win as many to the Lord while we can. You see, we are the hands and feet of God. We must become these people. We must become to these people what they need most. Be it family. Someone to confide in. You see, I'll give a good example. When I was in high school at the age of 16, my mother and father went through a divorce. My father was not the best person at that time, but I didn't have a father figure in my life. During this time, I was also Bible quizzing for the Richardson Church of the Nazarene. And the Bible quizzing leader there, his name was Kel Woods. You see, through my time Bible quizzing with Kel, it was over many years, he knew about my situation. And to me, he became almost like a father figure. Obviously, he couldn't replace my real dad, but he became as much as a father figure as anyone in my life ever had. He saw what was needed in my life, and he, to his greatest extent, filled it. You know what they say. God will always bring you back to Him. But these workers within the church that plant seeds, that outreach in these ways that you need, these are the hands and feet of Jesus. You see, the second excuse is one of my favorite, and one that I fell victim to a lot. Because in my younger years, I was a very shy kid. Until I started doing, yeah, you wouldn't think I was a shy kid up here speaking now, but trust me. Until I started doing chapter conducting for the FFA and got into public speaking, I would have been hard pressed to talk to anyone that I didn't know. This excuse is, well, people will judge me. This was one of my fears. I used to hate being judged. But nowadays, this is my favorite excuse because it simply has no premise. So what if people judge me? I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. You see, there was once a father who was a trapper and he, leave, he lived really, really deep in the Alaskan wilderness. He had a dog and his son. His wife had passed away a number of years ago, so as you can imagine, it got quite lonely. Well, one winter they got snowed in and the trapper had to go out and try to hunt for food. So he left his five-year-old son there with his dog. Well, the weather got so fierce outside that the trapper had to spend the night in the woods. The next day, he returned home to his cabin and found the door open. Furniture was overturned and a fierce struggle had taken place. There was no sign of his son or the dog until he looked over by the fireplace. There in a pool of blood with blood all over his mouth was his dog. The trapper was deeply distressed and quickly pieced together what he thought had happened. He figured the dog, without food and hungry, had turned on his own son and killed him. He began to gather his axe from his side and walk toward the dog, but instinct stopped him. He then set about searching the rest of the cabin furiously for a sign of his son. Eventually, when he came to the master bedroom, he heard a faint sound from under the bed. He tipped the bed up and discovered his son, 
unscratched and completely unharmed and without a drop of blood on him. The trapper grabbed his son and with relief turned around and saw a dead wolf lying in the corner. It was the dog who in fact had saved his son, not killed him. But how many times are we like this father, like this trapper, do we jump to conclusions? Do we quickly judge someone based on what they look like? You see, I have another story, just one more story for y'all today. And this one is from my personal life. It is about a man that I have the privilege of knowing by the name of Stephen. Now, Stephen is a Baptist, and we'll forgive him for that. But he was a friend for a number of years who uh, turned heads when he walked in the rooms. So Stephen was a troubled kid. He dropped out of high school at the age of 16 and started a band. Well, you might not think that's bad until you learn that he also lived in a drug house, was a guinea pig for the drug house, and his band was a satanic band. This kid at the age of 18 had an upside-down cross tattooed on his forehead, among other things that we would consider not too great. So this went on for a number of years. Until one night, in this drug house, he took some drug that sent him over the edge. He went to the hospital, was arrested, obviously, and then spent time in jail for drug abuse. And turns out he was also selling these drugs, so he got extra time for selling these drugs as well. Well, while he was in prison, this six foot five, 350 pound muscular man with a shaved head and an upside down cross on his forehead, he found God. Now, while he was in jail, through the prisoner uh, letter system, he, he got to know his now wife. Now, his wife at the time was also 18 years old. And at the time, she was the head mistress at one of the largest brothels in Dallas at 18 years old. Together, when they both got out, they sought out a church and both found God. Now, when he came into church... On this first Sunday, my friend tells me that just about everyone in there's head turned 180 degrees to look at him. Because he's a very intimidating man. He still has every single tattoo on his body. But I'll tell you right now, I have not met a more merciful and godly man than Stephen. You see, it's not our place to judge people. Everyone will be judged on the last day by the Father. It's not our place to judge people. Rather, it's our place to bring people God's love. And likewise, so what if people judge us for, spin, for spreading the Word of God? Well, all we're doing is what we're called to do. You see, this next excuse I have is one that I've also used. You see, I'm, I'm guilty of most of these. If y'all figured out the trend here? It's that God will find someone else or I'll do it later. You see, this mindset is incredibly dangerous. Unlike the others where you can be reassured in your faith that this one will leave you out in the cold. For one, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So as much as the do it later mentality goes, it goes right out the door as well. You see, we're commanded to win everyone to the Lord today. Not next week, not a year from to now. Today. You see, in Matthew, it commands us to go and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't say go tomorrow, or go next week, or go next month, or go when it's convenient. It just says go. You see on the other side of this, the I'll do it later, or if I'm not going to do it, God will find someone else. That one's rich. Because the truth is, yeah, God will find someone else. Because you're merely a vessel for His divine grace and truth. You are not the origin. You see, God's kingdom would not have stopped dead in its tracks if all 12 apostles following the death of Jesus had converted to another religion. God's kingdom is too powerful for that. You see, the fire of Christianity is an all-consuming and forever burning fire. Do you understand how many times throughout history that people have tried to wipe out Christianity? Almost too many to count. And you know how many times Christianity has come back even stronger because of it? Every single time. 
You see, the truth of the matter is God will not allow anyone else to stand in the way of His good news. Idle hands for God are a sign that souls that are not on fire for the Lord. See, this final one is one that I'm going to pick on my grandma a little bit. I've heard her say at times, and when she watches this, she's going to get on to me. So, you're ready for that. But uh, throughout throughout my growth as a Christian, uh, I feel like she's grown as well a little bit, and she doesn't use this anymore. And it's, I'm not up with the times. You see, being up with the times does not mean you have to understand what's going on. All this new stuff that the kids are doing nowadays, and you know, me being 26, you figure I'd still be up with the times. There's some of the stuff the kids on my bus do that I have no idea what's going on. This TikTok stuff and all these, yeah, I have no idea sometimes. You see, there was this research experiment that this marine biologist did, and he placed a shark into a large holding tank. He then released several small bait fish into the tank. As you would expect, the shark quickly swam around and attacked the smaller fish. The marine biologist then inserted a strong, clear piece of fiberglass into the tank, creating two separate portions of the tank. He then put the shark on one side of the fiberglass and the bait fish on the other side. Well, again, the, quick, the shark quickly attacked. This time, however, the shark slammed into the fiberglass. Undeterred, the shark kept repeating this behavior every few minutes, obviously to no avail. Meanwhile, the bait fish swam around unharmed in the second tank. Eventually, after about an hour into this experiment, the shark gave up. The experiment repeated several dozen times over the next few weeks, and each time the shark would get less and less aggressive and make fewer and fewer attempts. Eventually, the shark got so tired of hitting the fiberglass that he stopped attacking altogether. The brain biologist then removed the fiberglass divider, and the shark didn't attack. The shark was trained to believe that there was a barrier that existed between him and the bait fish. So when the bait fish swam around him, he did not eat them. They did wherever they wished. How many times are we like the shark? How many times have we tried to lead someone to Christ and we just slam into that fiberglass divider? And it seems we do it again and again. Maybe it's with the same person. Maybe it's with different people. All we hear are these words, no. So we stop trying. You see, the world nowadays is so full of evil, I've even asked myself sometimes, why try? You see, then I'm reminded about the story that Jesus tells us about the shepherd who left the 99 sheep to save the one. Every single person's life matters, no matter what they have been through. If a convicted murderer walked through those doors right now, is it not our place to preach the gospel to him just the same? You see, our God is the God of the strong and the faithful and of the Christian. But he is also the God of the prostitute, of the tax collector, of the killer, of the sinner, of the crook, of the thief, of the Jews, and of the Gentiles. You see, he's the God of all things. Not even all the powers in hell can change that. You see, the message we preach here today is the same message of redemption that has been preached for over 2,000 years. And for something to be preached that long, there's got to be something to it. You see, throughout the years, we can change the delivery. We can change the method of delivery, how we preach, but we will never change the message. I have a challenge for all of you today. My challenge is quite simple. And that's be the light of Jesus in someone's life this week. I don't mean you have to invite them to church, though you can. You know, church is probably one of the best places they could be on a Sunday. But I mean, provide something to someone who is in need. Be that a warm smile or a handshake. Be that a ride to work. We should let the light of Jesus shine in this dark in the world, and especially here in Greenville, Texas. And who knows, if we spread enough light, 
we may start to see a kindling of revival here in our own community. Let us stand this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You again for this message, Lord, and we thank You for all those who faithfully followed Your request that they go into the world and spread Your Word, Lord. We ask today that when You ask us to go, Lord, that we wouldn't say, well, I'm not the best one for that. Instead, we would say, okay, Lord, where to? We ask as we go from here, Lord, that we would be the hands and feet of You in this world that needs You more than ever. And we pray that You would be with us indeed until the very end of the age. We ask to listen to heavenly name.